Hi, I'm just jumping in here really quickly before we start to let you know, first of all, that today marks six months of the Diary of a Ditch Witch channel. So happy half birthday to us, yay! Thanks for being here to celebrate with me, even though you didn't know it, but you do now, so yay! The second thing is, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is marvellous to be able to report to you that we have achieved our 2000 watch hours which we kind of needed to get in the first six months of the year if we're going to make 4,000 by the end of the year. The other thing is that the required 1,000 subscribers is almost achieved in only six months. I can't believe it. I never expected when I started out that it was going to be this successful and that is all down to every one of you who are watching this. Thank you so much. Please do have a celebratory tasty beverage if you feel so inclined. I myself will probably go now and have a swanky latte. Thank you again, Gurmila Mahagov, and now I'm going to pass you over to the interview. Come on into the ditch. I'm your resident ditch witch, Tara Tyne, and we're about to get witchy, whether you like it or not. This evening, I am honoured and completely delighted to be joined by my longtime friend, Senna McGay. Uh, Senna grew up in Monaghan, and since then, he has lived in a Gaeltalk village outside of Galway and in Belfast, encouraging the language and culture up there. And now he lives and works in a Gaeltalk area in northwest Donegal. Senan works in community development and cultural activism and last year completed his PhD research on the contemporary practice of the Donegal Irish language storytelling tradition. You could say he knows a thing or two about Irish. And he has been a constant advocate for the Irish language and for Gaelic culture having innate value as part of our rich collective human heritage for at least the last 10 years or so that I've known him, which is probably one of the reasons we get on so well. Falter Road, Senan, it's lovely to have you here. Good morning, it's Harry, lovely to be here. <laughs> That's an excellent bio, you know, and it kind of lays out everything. I've been privileged enough to join you in some of those um, Irish speaking places that you've been living in the Irish speaking communities and to have tagged along on an adventure or two with you along the way as well. And I can say with confidence that your story has so much more to tell. Can you tell us a little bit in your own words about who really, I think it's like the search for the language has drawn you down this very unique path over the years? Right, so um, yeah, I'll do my best to answer that. Um, as I was saying, I'm not as good at talking about myself now about some other things, but anyway, um, my mother, I suppose, had the foresight to send me to the Gale School, you know, shortly after it started in Monaghan Town. And uh, I did that primary education through Irish and uh, secondary education and college oriel through Irish. And you know, for you know, for anyone who doesn't know there, like you know, I know a lot of your audience is international as well. Uh, the Gale schools were uh, they've been going very strong all around Ireland, particularly since the nineteen seventies, as part of this movement, like you know, to um, to strengthen the Irish language and communities all around Ireland. It's a very positive thing, and. Um, yeah, so I, like it just made sense, and when it was going on, like you know, and I was looking at what I could do after school, and uh, there was courses available in Galway, University of Galway, um, in different subjects through Irish, and it made sense to me since I didn't be education through Irish till then to continue in that way if I could at all. And thankfully, at that time, there was plenty of grant going as well. So there was a lot of support that isn't available today, but that's another that's another video, isn't it? Um, mm. But uh, so I went off there anyway, and. Um, I ended up through chance really and through meeting people and being involved in a, an independent community centre in Galway City and meeting people there, meeting some very good people, different characters around, end up living in a wee Gale's Hot Village just outside of Galway City and I lived there for um, almost seven years and uh, that particular village, um, uh, you, when you go back to the 1960s in that village, it was a very strong Irish speaking village, there was no house in the area in the 60s that didn't speak. Irish, no one spoke English as their vernacular, but I think the first um, house to change to English speaking, uh, that happened in the 60s, and since then it's become kind of a, it's, it's been sucked into Galway City, like it's a bit of a microcosm of the Gaelfa situation overall in Ireland, it's become more kind of upmarket, house prices are going up there, people using it to commute uh, from to Galway City for their jobs, 
and uh, it's become less and less of an Irish speaking place. But while I was there, uh, I lived in a house with friends and the Faraday man of the house, great friend of mine to this day, um, you know, kept an Irish speaking house and uh, we grew vegetables outside as well. We had a little plot outside the house and uh, we became very friendly with a lot of the, the, the older people, the older people around the area in particular, you know, um, Paddy and John up the road there and I think you know you, you, might remember, you might remember them yourself from the time you're there uh, mm-hmm. and they lived in a wee house we thatched cottage and often on a Sunday like myself and my friends would go running around you know we'd, we'd run outside on a Sunday and then we'd go past the house and um, we'd be waved in like and you know whiskey would be offered it wasn't usually drunk because it was off the drink at the time um, and we'd sit down and have a bit of chat and that but the sad side of it is as well in the se- almost seven years that I was living there I couldn't tell you how many funerals and wakes I went to as well mm. of all these old characters that died off there and they're the old ones around the place who were speaking Irish and um, it's the place has changed a lot like and it was amazing to see that kind of amazing and sad to see that change while living there you know um, but uh yeah, I, I visit there whenever I can. And hopefully when this fucking coronavirus thing is over, I'll be able to visit soon again. Yes, yeah. And in another place that I visited you that I found fascinating was um, when you were involved a bit with on Culture Lawn up there in Belfast as well. Just tell us, tell us a quick bit about that. Yeah, well, in, in West Belfast particularly, you have this amazing uh, revival of the Irish language, which has been going really strong. Um for, for a good part of the 20th century, like it goes back, well, it goes back to the 19th century, these big efforts to to uh, bolster the Irish language there, but particularly like in the past few decades, you just see this real strength around Belfast. And what the great thing about it as well is it's a real working class movement, you know, um, it's uh, common through an hour there was set up in, back in the 30s, I believe, there in West Belfast mm-hmm. uh, by local people, you know, working in different trades around the place, uh, but they saw the importance of the Irish language and uh, they learned it and they taught it and they created this really strong connection to the Donegal Gaeltacht as well uh, that, that's strong to this day between Belfast and Donegal. Um, but of course Belfast always had a strong Irish speaking communities and there's a massive connection there to um, the Oriel area as well which we, I think we'll be talking about later uh, to the area you know uh, that would encompass uh, Louth, Armagh, Monaghan, and that general uh, Gaelflat area, uh, the early 20th century. A lot of those people ended up in Belfast. You know, a lot of people, uh, the industries in Belfast were drawing people in, and you had this big community of Irish speakers, mainly from the Oriel region. And uh, they were known as the Fadgies because of the name Padgie. You know, and people, they were very well known around the markets in West Belfast. A lot of them were fish traders, and people would be shouting at each other, you know, if someone was called Paddy, it would be a Fadgie. And then in the vocative case in Irish, you know, and, um, that's how that name stuck to them. And uh, they lived, you know, in, in uh, around the Falls area, actually, like around kind of the, the centre of the Irish language revival today in Belfast. Um, so, yeah, it was great. It was great to, to be up there and... Um, yeah, I, I was involved in different things there, you know, community things going on, Lulu Lunas Festival, um, we were keeping bees in class as well, PhD research, Irish language storytelling, or Irish language storytelling in Donegal, um, which uh, was a privilege, brilliant to be able to do, you know, and very glad that I got support uh, to be able to go for that and learn so much off the different storytellers, uh, Shanahees that I was working with all around Donegal interviewing um, and just it was a few years where I could really focus on, on something that I was very much interested in and living in Donegal now, um, here in Slaken Island, North Donegal and working in the area. Yeah, well, I mean, the storytelling has always been huge for you. And, you know, the fact that I know you've been to kind of the Oriel Heritage Workshops out, no meat and things like that, when it kind of came to me to dig into the history of Inneskeen, which is the place that my dad was from. And I got a, a query from a cousin recently about one of the field names out there. It was called Shigara. And of course, I saw that as being she Gara, and I kind of thought, well, there's probably probably fairies in there somewhere. But um, God, I must get on to my old pal Senan and see what he has to say about it. And since we talked initially that time, 
my mind has been blown. Uh, the things that I've found when I've gone digging into Inneskeen's history, uh, unbelievable. So we've tried our best to compile it here for all you lovely viewers. Uh, I have made a very special timeline. <laughs> <laughs> that I end up like a crazy person all night making um, just to try and put some shape on this because we didn't have to dig too far to really pull up the threads of the entire history of Enniskeen village, both part of Oriel and even before that, because there seemed to have been a, a huge amount of stuff going on. I think the best place to start, Senan, is with the myth because storytelling is what you do. And you told me a nice one yesterday about, um, it's, it's, it's not Lou, I'm always on the lookout for Lou connections uh, because I'd really like to explain to my audience and to myself why uh, our county, County Louth, is named after him when he doesn't feature terribly prominently in our stories and things like that. You didn't find Lou for me, but you did find his father, Balor or Balor of the Fomorians, um, involved in some dealings with a magic cow over beyond near Carp across the far side of Inneskeen village. Tell us about that, please, Senan. Yeah, like, um, Lou mightn't be as prominent in other places, but certainly, like, in this part of Donegal, like, Lou is a, a, a very prominent character and um, actually an, an archaeologist who lives in uh, Dun Luhia here, Dun, Dun Luhia or Dun Louis, it's also known the Fort of Lou, is just under Errigal Mountain here. And Brian Lacey wrote a book called um, Lou's uh, Forgotten Donegal Kingdom. I think it's very hard to get us out of print, but it's about the archaeology of the area, but uh, he reckoned that there was a kind of a cult of Lou here in prehistory. Um, but uh, yeah, there's also there's a lot of stories uh, about uh, Baller as well, who was the king of the Fomorians, and he lived out in Tarry Island, which is just uh, out from the coast here in Lighanleela Parish. Um, and there's an amazing connection to uh, to the Oriel area of southeast Ulster as well, where we're from, uh, Monaghan, Louth, Armagh area. Um, I'm going to show a wee book here as well on the screen, um, Gran the Gaelic. That's uh, it was compiled by Henry O'Murrisa at the start of the 20th century. I uh, can't remember the exact date, but 19 something anyway, very early. And Henry O'Murrisa was a native speaker of Irish from uh, South Monaghan, from um, Dunamine in the Skeen area. I think in the Skeen, but it might have been Dunamine, but as you know yourself, they're right next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he by the way, we should, thought, before you go on, Sam, we should clarify for the viewers. We're talking almost interchangeably, uh, interchangeably about Loud Monaghan here because. Inneskeen, whilst the village is technically in Monaghan, a lot of the townlands are in Louth, and it actually really is on the border of three counties there, so that makes it a particularly interesting place. So, um, yeah, Dunamine is actually technically in Monaghan. The county, the county board. <laughs> huh? The county, board, the county borders, of course, as well, you know, were, were implemented with... English colonization, you know, in the plantation, which everybody laid down the county borders. They did use a lot of the previous borders before, but I mean, the whole, that whole area was all part of Ariel, um, you know, which we might be talking about in more detail later on. Uh, this kingdom that lasted for centuries yes. and centuries. Um, but and, I interrupted uh, this, you there. You were going to tell us about Balor. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, but just a wee bit of a, the back tale of it, I suppose that, um, you know, I've heard a lot of different stories about Balor in the area here. It's a very kind of, it's a very, you know, it's a story that's known by a lot of people in the area here and it's repeated like it's one of the most well-known ones as part of like, it's part of the local identity and it's part of Donegal, you know, and, and everyone, every, everyone would know about it. Uh, but what it was amazing for me was to find uh, a story related to Balor uh, and uh, to his evil doings uh, that came from the Oriel area. Um, Henry and Marisa collected this story off a of fellow there and uh, he was basically, he was told that um, Balor had this connection to um, the, the Oriel area. But anyway, so Balor, he was the king of the Fomorians. The Fomorians were uh, they were known as pirates. They were uh, a, ga a, a load of gangsters, basically. You know, uh, they raided uh, the Tuhaje Danan, the, who were the people of the goddess Danu, who lived across Ireland in prehistory, in our in our mythology. Um, 
and they were the two Vijay Dhanan would be considered, you know, they were a good people. Um, they became as well the good people or the she or the fairies as later waves of people came to Ireland in our mythology and in their under and in the understanding they uh, they became smaller and they went into underground places and um became the fairies but uh so they, but the two did on in that that time uh were uh they, they had every every skill and every kind of art and uh, use of magic as well and uh, they're all, also they're considered to be kind of you know the the the, the pre-christian gods but who lives in the country like like people you know i, I suppose that was the conception of the uh, gods at that time um and uh, yeah, like, but they were they were kept on under under foot and under boot and oppressed by the Fomorians, um, and they used to raid them and they used to take everything off them. They used to even kidnap their children and demand tribute from them and you know carry them away off uh, to the coastal islands where the Fomorians lived. And Tari was was their capital, and Balor lived there. Um, and there's still ruins of or or at least the markings on the ground of Balor's Fort and Tari, uh, you go there today, and uh, you know, um, the archae just archaeological records that will tell you that you know, there's, there's houses there, or there, the ruins of houses, the foundations of houses that are thousands of years old, and you can see the markings there, and you can see where the fort was, and the 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 the, the patterns in the earth. Um, but Balor was a uh, was supposed to be the giant uh, with a, an evil eye. And uh, it's usually said that the evil eye, he had one evil eye in the middle of his head. Some people said he only had one eye. Some people said, you know, he had two normal eyes and an evil eye. Uh, there was even people who said his evil eye was in the back of the head. But most people, I think, agreed that the evil eye was in his forehead. And um, it was so poisonous and venomous that he couldn't open it. Uh, you know, if he opened his eye, it would just destroy what was around him, you know, and it would kill and maim people. Um, so he had to keep his eyes closed. And people would say around here that uh, he kept a leather strap over his eye um, to, to, to keep it under lock and cover, I suppose. Um, but, you know, when he wanted to cause damage, that's when he would remove that. And it's also said as well that, you know, he was a giant as well. And the eyelids of his evil eye were so heavy and so fat that uh, it would take nine men with nine big uh, poles to come along and open up the eyelids of his eye, pushing, pushing them up. <laughs> Jeez, he was but, somebody. He was indeed. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, it, it, you know, there's a very long story, so I'll try and cut it short. There's a lot of different roads that go down with this, as these stories go. But mm. uh, amongst the two Hajjah Danan, who were these, you know, the, the good the good people who lived uh, on the mainland of Ireland and who were oppressed, uh, amongst them, there were different people who focused in on different trades and different arts. And... Um, there was a there was a guy called Kean there as well, and Kean had a magic cow. And the name of the magic cow was in Flask Edlin, uh, or the Flask Edlin, uh, as it's known. And this cow could be milked to your heart's content, and it would never stop producing milk. You know, and obviously at that time that was you couldn't imagine. I don't think any Irish person at that time, you know, would imagine any greater wealth than that, like because milk, you know, the land of milk and honey is to say, like it, it was the main source of protein and fats for people, like, and people lived on it, you know, and years later it was potatoes and milk, like, was basically, um, was what people kept people going. Milk was highly prized, and people were always worried as well about uh, evildoers stealing their milk, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Kean had business one day at. Uh, a smith's uh the name of the smith was given and he he was supposed to have lived locally as well there's a place not far from me here in the same parish of like and that place is called try or the 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 beach of the, the the hell of fire or the fire and the hell of the beach and uh just near that is the ruins of a fort that can be seen today and uh, that was where that was given you's fort uh doing Revenue, and he, he lived there and uh, Kian had some business there, and his business was uh, that he had to get his either a sword repaired or a sword made, whatever, whatever version of the story you want to go by. But uh, give news to work with his sword, and he went down there and he took the cow with him. Wherever Kian would go, we would always have this cow with him, you know. Um, and, As you uh, would. That's it. <laughs> very fond of his pet he was. But uh, 
he, he uh, tied the cow, you know, to a, a pole or something outside, and he went in to the smith, and he was he was there, you know, chatting away with your man while your man was working on his sword. Um, Balor, either through his spies or through use of magic, realized that this cow that he'd always coveted was just across Torrey Sound or just across the water from him, and uh, he set out to steal the cow, and he went out onto the mainland, and he used his magic to turn himself into the likeness or the image of a, a, a young red-headed boy. And this young red-headed boy innocently took the cow and led it along as if just to feed it a bit of grass on the side of the road or something, but of course took it into the boat and then out to Tori. And Keen came out, practically pulling the hair out of his head with sorrow and grief that he lost his prized possession, you know, when it was now in the clutches of, of evil valor, valor of the evil eye. Um, but um, anyway, Balor, as you said, was the he was the grandfather of Lou Lauada. Uh, Kian was was the father of Lou Lauada, Lou of the Long Hand. There's a whole story about that. But before I get to that, there, um, Balor kept uh, the last Gavlin, the magic cow, for uh, a good while, and it's said that he kept it in different parts of Ulster. But one of the places where he kept the last Gavlin was in Ariola, and particularly in Dunamoyne, which is just near Inniskeen in South Monaghan. And you know, um, Manon's castle is there, and there's you know there's a lot of connections in that area to mythology. Uh, Manon was another of the two Hijadanans, um, considered uh, the pre-Christian uh, sea god as well, or had a strong connection at least to the realm of the sea, and was supposed to have rode in a chariot across the sea. Um, but uh, yeah, the the last Gavin was kept in Dunamine in South Monaghan, and uh, during the time that she was kept there, people had best living you know uh, you could get at that time uh, with a never endless never ending flow of milk and uh, people were dancing and feasting and celebrating the whole time and you know they had the greatest wealth that was available to people at that time but as often happens you know someone came along a bad hard person who was living there locally who had to ruin the fun and they took along a sieve and they put the sieve underneath the last gap and started milking her into the sieve. Well, as soon as she noticed that the milk was going through the sieve and out into the soil, she wouldn't let out one drip, one further drop of milk and she let out a big bellow. Balor heard this with his, you know, through his use of magic and probably his spies as well, who were through the area at the time. Uh, he heard what was happening and he spoke to one of his servants and he ordered the servant to go to Dunham Wine in South Monaghan and take the last Gavlin uh, and her calf. She had a calf at this time to take the cow and the calf to uh, richer, uh, to richer grazing, richer plains uh, of, of grass in County Mead, the Royal Plains of Mead, as they say. But he gave a very specific order to this boy and he said, uh, you know, when you take the, take the, the cow across, uh, keep the calf in front of the cow at all times. Never let the calf go behind the cow because if you do, she'll realise that she's leaving Ulster and she won't take any further step outside of Ulster. So connected was she to Ulster. Fair enough, you know, says so he, he goes off and he takes the cow and the calf on a leash and they cross over the cross over the Boyne River. Um, interesting bit of etymology as well around Boyne, like from and woe in Boyne, the white cow as well. And there's a lot of stories about white cows. And there's Inish Bofinia, which is just beside Torrey Island here as well, the island of the white cow, related to stories around that. Uh, but anyway, a tangent I won't go down. Is that, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, cow so related they, players' names. That's it. Uh, they, they cross the, the Boyne River anyway. And the boy, whatever... Uh, Dalliness comes across uh, him or whatever whatever uh, kind of uh, uh, took his attention away from what he was supposed to be doing. Uh, he let the calf go behind the cow. And of course, she turned her head around. And what did she see behind her? Only the Banabodica or the mountains of Morn in South County Down. And she realized that she just crossed the Boyne and was had only after left Ulster. And at that point, she stopped moving. She wouldn't take one step further. And uh, she let out a big bellow, and Balor heard this, and he went up onto the top of his tower in Torrey Island. Torrey Island meaning the island of towers as well. And you can imagine this like Lord of the Rings or something, because Lord yeah. of the Rings 
Tolkien stole all this from these stories as well. Uh, you know, the evil eye of Sauron and that. But Balor went up at the top of his tower and he looked across the land and um, he uh, his servants came along with their nine poles and they opened up the, the, the leather strap over, over his evil eye and the, the, the eyelashes raised them up and he lay down his evil gaze upon the cow and the calf, the last cow and her calf. And he made two rocks of them where they stood. And um, the, the boy got away somehow. He ran, ran off behind something, um, probably behind one of those stones so the evil eye couldn't, couldn't uh, get him. And he managed to get away with his life. But those two rocks are still to be seen. I remember when I was living in Belfast, um, there was an occasion or two when I had to be in Dublin. And uh, I got a train from Belfast to Dublin. And when you look out on the left-hand side, coming from the north, from Belfast, out on the left, before you get to Dublin, before you get to see Lambay Island and Ireland's Eye and all that, uh, you will see two little rocks out in the ocean. One big one and one small one. And they were known by Pity Loud as, and Wo, I guess going, the cow and the calf. And the, the rationale for that, that the storyteller said at the time, was that at that time, uh, where, there were, where there is now the Irish Sea, at that time it was a grassy plain. And I found it amazing that, they, you know, that there was this understanding as well, uh, which um, you know, is proven through geological uh, research that, uh, you know, that there, the, there were lands off the coast of Ireland that were... Uh, that were there, there were lands where there is now sea off the coast, you know. Um, so it's a great connection there between this part of Donegal, uh, Clayhanila, um, Torrey Island, uh, and as Brian Lacey called it, Lou's Forgotten Kingdom, uh, where the Tuvija Danon lived here, and um, South Monaghan, and also these rocks off the coast of County Dublin, you know, and it goes all across the country. Like, and I, I suppose it, it's it's kind of a evocative of... Um, the, uh, the, the mythology that's to be found all around the country and it uh, was always ex expressed uh, and told from generation to generation of loon to loon from knee to knee in the Irish language and um, yeah, I, I, I like it. I like that I'm living here now and there's that connection. So. Yeah, well, I, I I mean, it's fascinating and when, when you said to me, like I I lived in Inniskeen for several years when I was younger and I had never heard of Manan's Castle when I went to look it up, <coughs> sorry, the article that I came across said that there was no, I think it may have been an old article too that I was reading, but said that there was no real evidence for it being connected to Mananon and suggested instead that there was an old high king of Oriel named Manan, who was a necromancing shapeshifter who tried to poison St. Patrick. So, I mean, that's that's it's kind of equally badass and fun to find out. And, you know, there's there's a million different versions of the stories. Again, with the glass Gevlin, whenever you said that to me and I looked it up, the version I read said it was the Cullen Hills, which would be closer to the Louds, Meads border. Um, so, you know, it's... We're trying to we're trying to dig here, and I know an awful lot more now than I did before, um, particularly about Oriel and that kind of thing. But again, that's still a little bit later. So I'm going to pull up my timeline now that I put so much effort into last night. Is that coming up okay there now? Can you see that? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we started. I mean. <laughs> Shocking amount of stuff. There was an archaeologist called Blaise O'Connor uh, in 2003 did a dig around the rock art at Dromerel, um just on the edge of Inneskeen village, on the southern edge of Inneskeen village. And um, she reckoned that there, there's recorded as being 70 examples of rock art in that area around Dromerel recorded over, I think it's 37 panels. It's one of the highest concentrations of rock art, certainly in Louds, Monaghan, um, if not possibly in the whole country. Um, you know, there's there's a, a massive concentration of souterrains, which we know were a later kind of defensive measure for the most part. Um, 
So, again, one of the highest concentrations uh, in Loud and Monaghan is around the area of sort of Inneskeen village back as far as Carrick Robin, which is around Kilcarely. Um, it's about halfway between Inneskeen and Dundalk. Um, we know that that road between Inneskeen and Dundalk, or one of them, there is now several ways to get from Inneskeen to Dundalk, uh, but there was an old Monaghan road uh, which is on my timeline is appearing in later maps of Dundalk but you know it's it seems as though it was sort of the most popular way to leave Dundalk to head west and in a few cases I think also to, to head south um, it looks as though along that ancient routeway I mean when you look at the the historic environment viewer I'm actually I'm just going to pull that up um, as well I only learned how to screen share today, so bear with me. Um, the historic environment viewer. Look at that. <laughs> it looks like a very bad dose of the chicken pox there. The play, you can't swing a cat without hitting something ancient um, in the area between Dundalk and Inneskeen and all around the surrounding areas. Just to break this down a bit for people who aren't from here, obviously this is Dundalk town here, massive concentration of stuff from kind of all uh, eras of um, of time. And then you've got sort of, I just put this ancient route way west of Dundalk kind of going directly west here to the left because we wouldn't be 100% sure, I don't think. Uh, which of the roads would have been the most popular route. I do know that uh, what was my father's land up here around Gorchin is recorded as having found uh, two Bronze Age burial urns with cremated remains, um, which also is very interesting because over here in Inneskeen village and down here at Dromural, you have evidence, a lot of pottery, a lot of old pot pottery, particularly at Dromural, you've got back to like Neolithic pottery, which, you know, we do, we would have less of that than we would have of, um, of pottery from later ages. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to see that, um, you know, and I learned then that uh, in my researches that, Ulster was certainly in the in the medieval times, much later on, was the predominant sort of production place for pottery in Ireland. So, you know, there was a distinctive, uh, there was a style sort of found there around the Hill of Fahersh. Uh, I did see it referred to as Dundalk pottery somewhere, but trying to find that article again has proven difficult. So, you know, I think it's it's reasonable to believe that there would have been production sites probably all around the area here. Um, there was also the remains of Neolithic houses found around uh, Dromiral, which, you know, archaeologists, Blaise O'Connor that worked on this, everybody was so excited to find what they found. And uh, Blaise basically concluded that there really should be, she would highly recommend that there would be further digging um, at different sites. You know, you've got more of the, the ancient rock art up here around Carrick Robin as well. So it's not as if it was all concentrated here. It just seemed as though, you know, when you look at it there as a landscape, the whole area between Dundalk up to Inneskeen, Dromural, and, you know, who knows what else in the surrounding countryside. Um, but, yeah, when you when you look up um, rock art, ancient rock art in Ireland on Wikipedia, County Dromural County Monaghan is actually one of the few places in Ireland name-checked as being a not noteworthy. So, um, was there anything else? I was going to show you the, um, the Bronze Age urns as well which were dug up in the 20s then. Oh, sorry, the, do you know what? The rock art first. Look at it there. Yeah, um, very tidy, concentric circles. You know, um, it's it's beautiful to look at. It's crazy to think it was just down the road for me uh, for so many years. I knew absolutely nothing about it. It's on private land, so... It's not really, it's not available for visiting at all, at all. Um, I don't know, maybe somebody watching this now uh, might have contacts and inns there and would give us a wee look in. Uh, I think one of the panels has been removed to the National Museum and uh, I think most of them are still left in, in situ. So 
Oh, I'd love to get a look. I really would. I love a bit of rock art. Sucker for a bit of rock art. There's the two, uh, the Bronze Age urns as well, which were found just a few fields over from my dad's place. So, you know, and around where he was living there, there were, I mean, there's ring forts. They say the amount of ring forts around that sort of part of Le North Loud and, and Monaghan is um, is huge. There's hundreds, seven, eight hundred of them, I think, still around the place. Um, and, you know, I suppose back then, you might have had a ring fort for defence that maybe wasn't lived in permanently, and then maybe at some point later on, people come in and thought, "Well, that's a you know that's not a bad place to put a house." And then they might have built a house in it, and so then you know maybe at some point uh, they might have been used for burial, they might have been used for all kinds of things. You said to me something else yesterday about what ring forts, what kind of uh, activity ring forts might have attracted. And what do you think? And I know a lot of the place names around Enniskeen might give us clues to that. You've got your Shigara, which is the one we originally came looking after, which is, I think you told me something like Fairy Vegetable Field. Um, you've got your Sheila, or pronounced Sheila locally, uh, which would be just slightly north of my dad's place uh, through Tati Nuske. Um So, yeah, what, what do you think now might have been going on in them ring forts? What, what, what an archaeologist would say about ring forts uh, is different from, I suppose, what how they were how they were um, imagined to the popular imagination. And, you know, in folklore, you know what what comes out in true folklore is they were fairy forts. You know, and um, you know they they are known by different names. And Irish have yes, have Ra, Dune, um, and uh, you know there are various different kinds of forts, ring forts, and uh, an amazing thing, as you said, is just the, the concentration of them around the southeast Ulster region. And you know, I think of uh, being a young lad around North Monaghan, used to ramble about and go biking the bike as well. And there's just these ruins everywhere. There's ring forts everywhere. There's stone monuments everywhere. And um, I don't know if there's a concentration like that to be found anywhere else in the country. I mean, Mead, you know, nearby is, is, has a lot of that kind of thing as well, but it's, you know, it is exceptional for Ireland. Like, um, and if anyone's interested in that, a great thing they can do is they can take out as well the Northern Survey map, you know, and you see these red circles on the OS maps that represent Ring Course, and they're just everywhere around that place. Uh, but they're here in, in this part of Donegal as well, and um, outside of. Uh, I said, of course, the Harka there, there's Cash and Lagarde, and there's Dune Lugia, as I mentioned before, the Fort of Lou, and there's different forts around the place. Uh, but Cashel is another word that um, is, means fort, usually a stone fort as well, a stone ring fort. Um, but yeah, they're always associated with the she or with the fairies in the popular imagination. And um, there's particular times of the year where the she or the fairies would be more active as well. And Halloween, Samhain being one, and the other time of the year that they were very active is a uh, date that's coming up, uh, Baltania, uh, the 1st of May. Um, and at different points of the year as well, you know, the, the she, just like people, uh, just like humans in uh, traditional society, society in Ireland, uh, a pastoral society, uh, you had the, the custom of bullying. So people, in the summer, we would bring the cows up to the summer pastures in the high on the higher grounds in the mountainous regions and that, uh, and especially women and girls would be very important in that work. Like and uh, people up would build huts for themselves to live in in the summer in the, in the summer pastures. So people had their summer residences and their winter residences, and Baltania yeah, is the traditional start of summer in Ireland, as you, you know, and so in, it's the beginning of winter. Um, so uh, around, you know, when summer was coming, uh, people would move up to their summer res residences and it was believed that the fairies was, would move to their summer residences as well. There would be particular places to be associated with. And these dates, so in Baltania, yeah, there would be treacherous times for humans because if we were moving around, the fairies would be moving around as well and you wouldn't want to cross paths with them because um, they're very particular about what they like and they don't like, you know, and they would kidnap people uh, and that kind of thing. Or, you know, they would... Um, take people's sight away from them, their hearing away from them, turn people into animals, do whatever the hell they wanted with people, you know. Um, but I suppose they were good to people as well, you know, people who were good to them. And there's a lot of references in folklore as well uh, to people trying to keep the fairies happy. 
lots of different customs around Baltany, like uh, you know, get the gathering of flowers and people putting them outside of uh, window sills, outside of doors uh, to protect the house, or you know, possibly going back to earlier times, pagan times, where offerings are made to pre-Christian gods. And as I said, you know, uh, you know yourself, um, the fairies, the she were. Uh, you know, in, in the mythology, they were the two who did that and are the, 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 the deities before who became smaller people and went underground and went under the sea and went into the air and this kind of thing. So, yes, it's interesting. There's a lot of different customs around that as well, the decorating of May bushes and that kind of thing. Um, I also read references to uh, people going to particular places that were associated with the fairies uh, and offerings being left there, uh, in, including even... Um, a custom that would happen normally in Ireland uh, in you know in earlier times when we had more of a pastoral society at that time uh, people would actually let blood out of their animals like cattle and that kind of thing uh, something that's done in you know parts of Africa today um, and uh, the English uh, always thought it was very strange you know the Irish people they thought they considered it a savage custom that we would keep our animals alive and let blood out without killing them and use that blood to make pudding or you know for it to be consumed in different ways but you know blood was also let out uh, around sites that were associated with the fairies as well as a way of protecting people and keeping the fairies, the she, the good people happy, you know. Yeah, that's very interesting. You said that about, um, you said about making sausage, like, you, you know, I mean, people that's into Irish culture will know about the, the black and white pudding. What they almost definitely won't know is that Dundalk has their own particular kind of pudding. It's a delicacy here. It's red pudding. You know, uh, so it's it's one you don't find too many places. I did find that there is one somewhere else. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a part of England or possibly a part of Scotland that keeps coming up. But I'm going to say nothing about Scotland because I don't. A know. great black pudding down <laughs> Kerry. One time I was in Kerry for the Irishists, and and uh, we had, it was there with some friends, and we're we're travelling in a van, and uh, we had to stop somewhere and get some black pudding. I can tell you it was class. Yeah, for people that don't know, it's uh, I think I'm not sure which ones. I don't know if they're all made from blood, but yeah, it's like a blood sausage, sausage, a sausage, sausage. Yeah, it's very tasty. It's very very tasty. I'm just having a look here at my questions, then. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm throwing you a bit of a curveball now because I don't actually know if I, I didn't check with you first if you know much about a uh, language in Ireland pre-Irish language um, but I did notice when I was kind of reviewing my timeline this morning that um, there's a bit of a gap there between sort of you know we brought it up there to on my timeline it shows um, I'll just show that again so everyone can see where we're going um, we've come up here as far as you know about 100 AD from the early Neolithic to the early Bronze Age through to the Iron Age you know, it kind of killed me a little bit inside to have to put it all into sort of one little neat column like that because, you know, I'm particularly interested in prehistory myself. I think there's such a colourful history there. But I had, to, I had to cut it off somewhere, you know. There's only so much room on the timeline. So the next thing we have coming up there really is around, you know, around the 300s, around the 4th century, um, with the establishment of Oriel, or I'm not even going to try and pronounce the Irish. I'm sure you'll enlighten us on that in the minute. But that also brings us back, the, one of the, the, the key kind of uh, things from then is that if Manan was this necromancer and shapeshifter, you know, living in the time of Patrick, that he would have been there not too long after the actual establishment uh, of, of Oriel, like there seated at Manan Castle at Dunamoyne. Um, so yeah, I think it's 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 a good time now for you to tell us a wee bit about the history of Oriel, and I know it's a huge ask, but if you could... Well, I, 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 I'd tell you, I suppose, you know, the little bits that I know, but I, I know that uh, Oriel was founded by those three brothers the three collars as they were called and uh Colin Wish was I suppose the, the ringleader and um he, he he bought his uncle for the kingship of Ireland and he became high king of Ireland but at a later point in time he carved out his own little kingdom for himself in the Oriel area 
Um, the name uh, Oriel, as we say in English, uh, Oriela in Irish, uh, comes from or for gold and gala for hostages. The golden hostages are also interpreted as the golden chains. And I don't know exactly why it's called that, but um, yeah, um, Colin Wish um, was supposed to be my own second name, McGee. Uh, he was supposed to have been the ancestor of the McGees as well, funnily enough. And his grandfather, uh, his grandfather was the High King of Scotland. Um, but as regards, yeah, well, the, the Manon one is an interesting one, I suppose, like, just like the, I suppose, the pre-Christian deities being, um, you know, made smaller uh, in the mythology and in people's imagination as well, uh, you see the, the characters, I think, uh, through stories and through the process of Christianization being made smaller and more diminutive all, over time as well. And it's very possible that that guy who's referred to as a chief there, you know, was the the Manon or the Manon and was both versions of the name who was considered the, you know, that, that God kind of character as well, you know. Uh, they change over time and, you know, of course, stories change over time as well. And um, it's hard to be certain as well. So it's supposed to in the area of pseudo history too, you know, there's, there's this overlap in, in, in the Irish oral tradition and in the Irish manuscript tradition of different layers of history and mythology as well and different versions of it all the time so it's always debatable like there's very it's very hard to take an, an absolute position at all in these matters you know but well they had they had an awful habit of attributing great uh, ancestors to themselves ancestors to themselves as well didn't they you know the genealogies yeah. would be hyped up when they'd be you know if you were going to announce the, the new high king in, in the course you might say that he descended from from Lou or you know from whoever was kind of uh, favorably looked upon by the populace back in the day. You could say it was, you know, a bit of a political move. You could you could recognize in uh, in, in Irish politics today. But, a lot of rewriting. Yeah, to yeah. Constantly rewriting the manuscripts. You know, different different uh, families, different tribes vying for power. Um, but you've touched on a very interesting point there as well. But the Irish language, you know, academically, uh, they talk about you know old Irish and it being from about the sixth century AD or seventh century AD. Um, uh, they also talk about archaic Irish, which is, you know, there is um, mm. archaic Irish, even an older version of the Irish language that's found on home stones, particularly, you know, there's lots of home stones that date to centuries before that even. But you know, we have no uh, records of any language being in Ireland before the Irish language. So the Irish right. language is in Ireland certainly for uh, at least 2,000 years, to say, academically and possibly for um, a millennium more than that, or who knows, you know. I mean, it's considered a Celtic language, but, um, you know, uh, Celt the, the term Celtic is always up for debate as well. Mm, People are constantly problematic arguing, like, at best, yeah. But, uh, you know, like... <laughs> I suppose it's because, like, you know, the Romans and the Greeks and all these people, they had they kept these written records in an early stage. The Irish didn't start writing until we were Christianized. Um, so that's why they talk about old Irish starting in the sixth century. That's not to say it wasn't there before then, but mm. the written, written records start then. We know that there was, there's archaic Irish records on the old stones before then. But, you know, people are pretty sure that the Irish language was spoken before then around the place as well. The Irish language also has a lot of, while it is a Celtic language, it has a lot of similarities to other Celtic languages around Europe. It also has a lot of differences as well. So possibly there was even a mix between a Celtic language and a language that was there before there was any Celtic influence in Ireland. Or maybe you can't even draw that line clearly at all, you know, because there was a cultural continuum always, you know. Mm. So the short answer is we've absolutely no idea what language was being spoken in Oriel between its establishment around the 300s and um, the first recorded usage of Old Irish around 600. Mm. Well, it was uh, Irish was was certainly being used. Some version of the mm. Gaelic Irish language. Um, if there was another language there, um, I don't know. You know it. Uh, but I, I think we can be pretty sure that, uh, um, you know, going back into the years BC, that Irish was dominant in Ireland, you know. Um, there may have, may, might have been other languages that were subsumed into Irish or that were wiped out entirely, but it's in the midst of history at this stage. Mm, well, it's so well established, too. Um, do you know what? And it's so full of magic. Like, you know, maybe... I've 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 tipped on you know how the the actual language itself sort of makes two D two D things two D everyday things that sound mundane uh, in English kind of gives them sometimes several different layers of meaning. Uh, 
Do you know, I didn't even, you, you, I remember you trying to tell me that over the years and me kind of going, oh yeah, you know, but I didn't really understand, you, you know, you could just be chatting with someone and it's, it's it sounds like you're, you're weaving spells nearly, um, I don't know, I can't think of any good examples off the top well, of my head. You're talking about Balthany earlier on, you know, and there's, there's mm. a common phrase used in Irish, either yeah, henny Balthany, which means to be between the two fires of Balthany, and as you mentioned, you know, there was the custom uh, of lighting two fires and driving your cattle between the fires to mm. bless them and give them good luck for the year. And when you say in Irish, it means to be in a dilemma between the two fires of Um Just in this area, <laughs> not far from where I am, is a townland called Baltania as well, where there's a, there's a hill called Crook the Baltania, the hill of Baltania, and that was where Baltania celebrations were held locally, you know, and um, fires were, were, were let at Baltania, and, uh, you know, there was the the main fire and other fires were supposed to be lit from them. They were part of the pre-Christian setup, but survived much longer in lots of parts of Ireland and Scotland, Gaelic speaking areas after that. But um, I mean, central in the Gaelic culture historically and up to the present day is Baelagis or mouth, mouth learning, mouth education. And you know, the, an oral culture. We had a very strong and have a very strong oral culture and also a written culture as well. You know, particularly since Christianization, so much of the stuff being written down with Christian flavors in it as well. Mm. But a lot of things are preserved through that too, to hark back to years before that. Um, but uh, concurrent to that or running at the same time, you have uh, the oral tradition, which goes on till today. And I mean, not far from here in another parish, um, another area in Randolph Barsh uh, there's a great storyteller there uh, Brianna Newell and she has a, a, vo- a version of the Cucullin tale you know Cucullin uh, and you know being a the son of Lou Lauada who we're talking about earlier on as well like um, I'll be doing a video has, about him very soon looking forward to it hmm. I, can, I can see the picture as well in the mirror there Lou I forgot to mention, yeah, Lou. Um, my viewers will probably know Lou just works his way. He worked his way into my into my life, into my office, and today he worked his way into this video, this interview. He just demanded to be part of the chat. Set up the camera. Did not try to do it. Dave actually had to point out to me that Lou is 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 reflected in the mirror just there behind me, literally watching over my both of my shoulders at once. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and of course my, my infamous co-host, we couldn't leave him out because he does pop up a little bit on the next leg of our timeline uh, to, you know, the little green man. Uh, we haven't named him yet. We might do that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah, so the, the, the very next thing then, I mean, not too long after the establishment of Oriel, and you have really the sort of early Christian explosion. The next thing we have here, um, sort of around the the 400s, kind of early Christianity started kicking in, and I've I've sort of lumped it right up into the the Viking period there, because right where St. Dig established his monastery in the centre of Inneskeen village, uh, there was a, a round tower put there a few hundred years later to ward off uh, the Vikings or to protect from them. So, you know, the, the two, as we view the landscape in Inneskeen today, sort of go hand in hand. But St. Dig, I'll tell you, was a very interesting guy. Um, I, I made a mistake when I was talking to you the other day. I said that he um, studied under Columba. He didn't. He was actually more of a contemporary of uh, Columba and his monastery when he did establish it in Inneskeen was blessed by St. Columba um, but Dig, St. Dig himself actually studied at Devonish in Fermanagh and um, after graduating from there he made, now it's reputed I have seen different figures which probably are a little bit more accurate but the legend goes that he made 300 bells, 300 croziers and 300 gospels for Kieran of Sagar, um, sort of as a gift. And those were distributed around monasteries. Uh, I don't know if it was around the country or around the area, uh, but it is interesting that at one of the digs at the the Martin Bailey just over the road, they actually found a bell there as well, which I thought was just a nice, you know, it may not, it probably wasn't anything got to do with the dig. I don't think any of his his creations have existed, but, or have survived, but um, I just, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice kind of, it's a nice tie because I really do feel, you know, 
right up to to this point, like Saint Dig was clearly an an artisan. He was actually described as as working as an artisan for Kieran of Sagor when he was completing those works. Um, so he was obviously very artistic himself, a, a very very talented smith. Um, and he came, and you'd have to imagine it's not too far of a leap of the imagination to sort of go, well, you know, if the place had been known as perhaps the center of arts before that, that that might have actually been one of the things that attracted him to to set up there, or, or you know, one of the reasons it was decided by the higher ups that he was the right man to to set up the monastery in Enniskeen. Um, so yeah, just a very very interesting looking at that. Um, as I say, then the round tower was built later on to defend from the Vikings uh, three levels, I think, to that. And there's not much of it surviving. And there's been there's been stuff has happened to it and done to it over the years. So it's um, it's it's just not in what, in what you'd particularly call original condition. Uh, but yeah, that sort of that Christianity uh, brought us through then to you know, the later medieval period uh, between the 1100s when you had the Anglo-Norman invasion of Ireland and um, shortly after that, you had our old friend on this channel, Edward de Bruce, God love him, passing through uh, on his way south after landing in Ireland and him and his armies took a rest on the banks of the Fane in Inneskeen village, uh, the Fane River, if you don't know. I actually, I hope to do a video from Inneskeen one day just to show you the Fane. Um, I was very lucky to, to be able to, to grow up just down the road from it. Um, so the, the other thing that happened, yes, out of Inneskeen, which surprised me to find, was that the Annals of Ulster were actually compiled under the patronage of a man who used to be the Paris parish priest of Inneskeen, Canon Cahill Oak McManus. Um, you know, and then we're up to kind of the end of Oriel. Um, can you come in there, Senan, and tell us really how and why and what happened with the with the dis disestablishment of Oriel there around 1585? Well, that's according to, to Wiki, but it was there or thereabouts, most likely. Um, what happened? Well, um, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm in any position to say exactly what happened at the end of Oriel. I'm sure there's intricacies there that I don't have, but you're coming into there to, you know, the time of the plantation of Ulster. And uh, I, I know that um, the Oriel area and the Mon County Monaghan area particularly uh, was different to the rest of Ulster in the sense that it wasn't directly planted at, at that time. But a lot of the chieftains in the area uh, submitted to the English, um, I suppose prematurely, you know, because uh, you had the nine years war after that. Um, but uh, us, uh, Monaghan, uh, County Monaghan wasn't planted directly then, but uh, a lot of chiefs they sold their lands to the English afterwards and they bargained with them and were eventually brought into the colonization process. Um, but yeah, you had the flight of the Earls, the early uh, 17th century in the plantation of Ulster as well. Um, but, you know, that wasn't the end of, of Gaelic history at Oriel uh, by any means, because uh, the Oriel region, um, Monaghan, <coughs> Louth, Normagh, was, was a, an Irish-speaking stronghold up until the early 20th century. Uh, and, you know, these days, the only Gaeltach regions where Irish is uh, the community language are in um, mainly the west coast and the, the south coast of Ireland and there's a bit in me there as well but Dun particularly Donegal, Mayo, Galway, Kerry, Cork and Waterford, County Meath um, but Oriel was was one of these strong Gaeltach areas as well and there was a Gaeltach college founded there to, um, to teach people Irish as well in mm. the early 20th century and the last native speaker of uh, the Irish language uh, from the Oriel from County Lau, sorry, died in 1969 and she was Anya Anluin and uh, there was people in, in uh, other parts of Oriel, um, like in South Armagh, I believe until the 80s, you know, who, who had the local dialect of Irish and then they taught other people as well and people carried on and there's, people, there's plenty of people around now who are part of the revival of Irish in those areas through the Gale schools and families who speak it at home and that. Um, in the Middle Ages, Oriel, uh, and uh, you know, well after the plantation of Ulster as well, Oriel continued continued to be a Gaelic cultural powerhouse. You know, with uh, poets like Art McCoy and Cahal McGillagunna, you know, from 
composing these famous poems and sharing those songs, which are sung to this day in Gaeltacht regions and in, in the Oriel area. Um, you know, with songs like Urshke Lakrogan and Urshke Gain Lakhenche and lots of other songs like that. And Buha Lonernia, Cal Magalagoma as well. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing as well that you find these songs, they travelled, uh, you know, over the years from the Oriel region to, to Donegal. Um, and uh, maybe there's some recordings, you know. I was just recordings. thinking that, yeah, I'm going to stop that share there now and just uh, play this and hope that it carries okay through my microphone. It's all the oral dialect, as I was saying, you know, like what was being spoken. Unfortunately, we haven't got access to recordings that were made in Monaghan. There were recordings made in Monaghan in the 1930s, but I was told that they were actually, they were lost in transit. They were lost somewhere or destroyed, possibly. But mm. it was the same dialect in Monaghan as was being spoken in South Armagh and Louth. And, you know, as I said, this book that I showed earlier on, Grand the Gate Against Monaghan Stories, there's Shanok Lalu that was written by Henry O'Murray, a native speaker from Monaghan. Um, and he travelled also and wrote down the Proverbs. Uh, there's also this here, Shkeli Arni, uh, I have a photocopy of the book here, uh, that was collected by Shosu Lija, who is a Protestant Scalic scholar, uh, stories by uh, storytellers in South Armagh, Monaghan, Loud, you know, lots of Monaghan dialect there, but people can listen to these recordings of people in South Armagh and in Loud, and, you know, this is the oral dialect, very similar to, do, to the Donegal dialects as well today. Yeah, I'll hit play on it here and I'm going to link this website in the description below as well if there's anybody there that wants to check it out. So this is the loud dialect of, say, what we call, I suppose, Oriel Irish. August Shearum, August Hansa McClough, Poor McClough, Poor Maradona, Stanja Hornish, August Sligma, Drak Moy Emma or a Nair. Stanja Rist, August Hastadma, for Hurma, three Kimmy Wayne. She is Roman in Lone, Gangon. Uh, there's three minutes and 41 seconds of that story, which is about my father on the fishing rod. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'll stick that link in the description and I would highly recommend checking it out. I wasn't actually aware that there were recordings of the Oriel dialect you just sent that to me before we started here today and it's great to hear that it, it, you know it does sound like listening to somebody local um I recognize the drawls and the lilts yeah as you, you've touched on there um I'm going to just pull back up my uh my timeline because I'm lost without it now I, just a wee interesting point as well that you know people might find interesting you know of course Loud is considered part of Leinster today, but for a lot of the Middle Ages, Loud was considered part of Ulster, you know, and it, even yeah. like there was a times, there was times when the Ulster border extended to the Boyne, like in the story about Ballard and the, the last Gavlin, uh, which you crossed the Boyne, she left Ulster. Uh, but the dialects that were spoken uh, in Oriel, including Loud, were completely Ulster Irish, very, very similar to the mm. Irish of all the Irish have spoken in Tyrone. Um, a notable feature of it is. Uh, the use of the word ha, you know, for people for listeners who do know Irish, you know, um, I suppose in standard Irish, you know, most dialects, uh, the verb to be, the positive ta and the negative ni ro. But what, what is used in Donegal sometimes, in Donegal you have ni ro, but you also have ha ro. And in, um, in the oral dialect, it was always ha ro. And that's the same as what's in Scottish Gaelic as well, you know. So there's this cultural continuum, of course, from Kerry all the way to the north of Scotland, including the Isle of Man as well. And you've got, got these dialects. And, you know, generally speaking, closer places are together, uh, the more similar the dialects and the further away they are, the more different the dialects are. Yeah. But um, you got all these local variations as, as well. But, you know, like listening uh, listening to that story there, of the you know, it, it could almost be someone here in, in North Donegal speaking. It's very, very similar. There are differences, of oh, course. Yeah. The music of the of his style of speech 
is much more south Ulster, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even the variations, you know, like within families. Sam, and we were talking earlier about another place that um, I didn't really want to lump in with the the mythology of Inneskeen because I have absolutely no story to back it up. But all we have is the place name, which is C O L A, uh, which is spelled S W E O L A. And I got on to a cousin of mine um, from Mucker in the skiing earlier to find out how that's pronounced. And she wasn't too sure. She had actually never heard of it. So she got on to her mother and her mother's sister. So two siblings within the same family and both are pronouncing it differently. One of them saying Seola and the other one saying Sheola. So we're fairly certain from the, I think it was a Dukas article I read um you know, it is the seat of Fola, who was one of the sort of sister goddesses, along with Eru, she was yeah. a sovereignty goddess for Ireland. And so that's the seat of Fola. So it's the residency of Fola. It's just north of Inneskeen village there. Uh, I think it's in the Glebe. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's very interesting that, you know, they're a large family and we didn't ask all the siblings how they would pronounce Seola or Seola there, you know, but sure there's... <laughs> <laughs> there could be different ways, you know, there could be a third way within the same family to pronounce that one place in their own village, you know. Um, so it, it's fascinating, you know, that's that's one thing where, you know, it would, would really catch me out when it comes to trying to attack the language, trying to learn it, um, trying to become the Irish language, you know, uh, is that my familiarity with it comes from teachers throughout school who as I've said before kind of you know had very different dialects and you could you could hear maybe the, the Connemara coming through and things like that so it was you kind of spent most of your time nearly just trying to figure out what what they were saying uh, yeah. never mind how you were going to say it and it sounded completely different when you'd say it and you'd be saying it with a big Dundalk accent on you and you know I really enjoyed your video on on the on the curses and uh, I think you, your Irish that was great as well. Like, and I've had many conversations with you in Irish as well. Like, so don't be putting yourself down. Okay, um, you haven't but, had that many. <laughs> Thanks for talking me up. <laughs> <laughs> the dialectical differences are very interesting, but at, at the end of the day, it's the one language. And I mean, what the speaking Connemara is Irish, but the speaking Kerry is Irish and Bully Gaul and yeah. the Oriel, it's all Irish. Like, and um, you know, and it's all this continuum as well. Like I was listening to recordings on that website as well. This is recordings from County Cavan, you know, and like that being kind of on the way to Connacht, you just hear much more of a Connacht influence there, you know. Mm. Like, whereas in Donegal, you know, boat would be Bwed or Bwad, and you know, in, in, in Oriel, you know, Bwad. Um, but uh, in around Cavan, you hear Bod, which is oh, like, you know, out west, like, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a tower, like, you know, you've got the the, di the dialect differences. You've got the political differences, too. Like, one of the things that kind of surprised me um, when I was having a dig into Podrigine's book, I'm actually just going to show that. It's here somewhere. Um... I'm sure most people probably watching this that's into Oriel have already heard of this. So yeah, that's it there. It's Podrigini Hulahan, a hidden Ulster, and it's songs and stories of the Oriel tradition. And it's fabulous. I was going through it there and I was kind of learning about the techniques by which, you know, the Irish language was being preserved kind of in the 19th century. So you had... What surprised me was a lot of Protestant clergy in particular in the area going around in a skiing, going around Anavaki, Sheila, all Sheila, those places, um, and collecting the language. The problem was, you know, a lot of the parishioners were sort of being told, oh, oh that's that's very anti-Catholic thing that's going on there, you know, and that's um they were ashamed to speak their their Changa, their language. And um in in some cases uh, you know they were they were blatantly punished for it like you've got the mass rocks there where people would have had to say their their catholic mass ask Elga sort of out in the out in the countryside uh really uh i'm right on that they were saying that the mass at the rock ask Elga, were they oh yeah oh surely yeah, yeah. i mean like in in the 19th century, like up until the mid 19th century, particularly, uh, rural Ireland was Irish speaking. It was it was majority Irish speaking. Um, yeah. 
and particularly in Aria, like it being one of the strongholds up until the 20th century. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a terror just that the, you know that the the political or the religious divides really and the the orders from the the propaganda and the orders from the top down how it it really actually probably prevented a lot of it being saved. Though we do have. You know, we have plenty, I suppose, and we can't really complain. But even then, of what was collected, a large amount of that has also been destroyed over the years as well. well so, in a sense, it's a miracle that you know the Irish language is still alive today, and there still are communities that speak it. When you consider, you know, uh, what uh, the people of this country went through for centuries, you know, um, just disaster after disaster, and oppression, slaughters, famines. Uh, an education system that was designed to eradicate Irish people being punished for speaking the language constantly. And then the economic oppression that continued even after that, you know, I mean, even after the, the uh, foundation of the Free State, uh, the South, uh, sort of part of Ireland in 1922, um, up until the present day, Gaeltacht areas on the West Coast are still economically marginalised, socially mm -hmm. marginalised, very high rates of emigration, unemployment, um, and, you know, it, it just, it leaves Irish speaking communities in a weaker position always. And there's always this pressure to turn to English, you know, in the process of cultural change um, through economic pressure is continuing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I suppose then, you know, it's 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 great that we had the establishment of the likes of Conru and Gaelga then to, to try and encourage the culture and encourage the language. Um, so that probably carried us through then the establishment of the Free State. And of course, then there was great um, Irish and, and Gaelic, Gaelic revivals going on down the country as well. Everyone was kind of into it at that point. Um, yeah, the 20th century then, as far as Enniskeen is concer concerned, well, the last Gael Gorey that I have heard about through sort of the oral tradition, uh, through my own connections with Enniskeen, um, was that where my grandmother lived, there were Gail Gorey living behind her house. So on one of the, the hills, presumably in Taddy Nishke there, there was the last house of Gail Gorey in that area. And they, you know, my, my nanny still remembers them. So they were within her lifetime and she was in her nineties when she passed away a few years ago. So, you know, that brings us right up into, you know, the last century. And um, it's interesting, you know, with all of that that had gone on, one of the things that I pulled up when I was, I was checking to see what sort of happened in Inneskeen uh, in those years, uh, I found a story in uh, Monaghan Folktales. I actually, I don't have the book to hand here, but it's Monaghan Folktales by uh, another friend of mine, Steve Lally. Um, he's he's a great man for collecting the stories too, and he had one in there which was simply titled "Inneskeen's on Fire." And the thing was that there was a, as you mentioned earlier, you know the fairies far being, you know the, the small, cheery little flowery creatures of the Victorian imagination. They were more like the kind of supernatural presence that would steal your child and place one of their own in its place and you mightn't necessarily know that that had happened. Um, so there was re reported to have been a woman walking around in a skiing village and pushing a pram. And she stopped, I think it was to ask for, for coal for her fire or something like that. And the man that she stopped and asked knew that the child in the pram wasn't a real boy. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't a real human child. And so he started shouting that Inneskeen was on fire. Inneskeen's on fire. And when he turned around again, the changeling, the funny boy, as he was referred to in the story, it was recorded exactly the way it was told to Steve. Uh, the, sorry, exactly the way it was told to Henry Glassy in 1985 for his book, which I also don't have to hand. But uh, that, that, I think that's where Steve got the story from. But apparently it was... Inneskeen is where the fairies came from and in order to get your man to clear off you had to say ah oh, the village is on fire you know Inneskeen's on fire and your man cleared off and was seen no more so it's a terror that even that late you know and, and I've I've heard mention of there being spirits down the bog around where my granny lived and uh, where the farm was down there and 
you know, it's something that people would still be very aware of. So, you know, the fairies are existing in the place names. The language is surviving as well in the planet, the place names. Um, and yeah, I mean, then it kind of came on into the, the latter half of the, the 20th century and, and Inneskeen was once again kept very busy by its prominent geographical position on uh, the border of three countries. Very Being very diplomatic here in the way I put this, um, I would just like to say solidarity with anyone who's watching this who's up in and around the area of Belfast at the minute. We're here, we're holding space for you and we just hope that there'll be some kind of a resolution uh, before too long. Inneskeen had had a rep, quite a reputation uh, around that time for anyone that isn't familiar with sort of you know the, the, the borderlands in Ireland uh, around the time of the troubles in Ireland there was a lot of stuff went on in Inneskeen but I purposely wanted to leave that as kind of a very small footnote at the end of this conversation because it is far from the only history in Inneskeen as is the GAA you know as much and all as I enjoyed this book which is also I think quite a rare one to get your hands on. That's the Inneskeen story. Uh, it's from it's by a guy called Larry Megan. It's from 1888 to 1988, but it did have that picture of the Dromeral rock art that I showed you earlier on in it. Um, it is largely a history of the GAA in Inneskeen, which is a huge part of the culture in the village, a huge part of the culture in both Louth and Monaghan. Um, but again, just like the other things that Enniskeen is sort of traditionally known for in more in more recent times, um, it's not all that there is to the place. You know, uh, the, as far as I can make out, as far as Blaise O'Connor, the archaeologist over at Dromeral, was concerned, the place was an absolute centre for the traditional creative arts. You know, pottery with the rock art leading the way. Um, you know, they were well defended. <laughs> at all their suitorains. They really were um, leading the way as far as civilization in the area went. Uh, highly sort of um, complex people that I'd really love to know more about. And I feel like we have gotten considerably closer during the course of this conversation, Senan. Mm. I, I do feel like we have like we've made contact with the other side, like we have reached out and they have answered us. Uh, it's been such an absolute goldmine of information that we've pulled out just bouncing off each other here. And I certainly think it's something I'm going to have to look some more at um, and, and try and dig more into. I'm really looking forward to seeing any comments uh, and things that people have to say about this afterwards, because I'd say there's probably people out there that knows a lot more than we do, Sen, and, um, but we had to do our best. You know, it's something that's just been kind of niggling at me now for a while. And uh, I, my, my dad was a great man for the history too. I think he'd be very, very proud of me um, finding it all out and trying to compile it. He mightn't have been mightn't have been too proud of me sitting up doing it at three o'clock this morning like a maniac. But you know, we did it. We made it then, and we're through to the other side. We have jumped the ditch. <laughs> but it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it, and you know, we touched on so many different things. There are so many different layers to it. You know, it's a learning process. The whole thing, I think. I'm always learning from people around me. I'm learning about uh, me, me mother uh, in Monaghan there. Like there's so much of local history and and, I, and I'm constantly learning from her and learning from people around me in Donegal. When I was in Galway and Bel Belfast, it was the same. You know, I mean, it's it's something, something in our, you know, pe pe there's, a, I suppose, a, a stereotype or a characterization, which is quite true about us in Ireland that we're kind of obsessed with history like but it does there is a very long history and we have a strong oral account of it and a strong written account of it as well so it comes down through these generations and always ha has that importance as well and it carries on through the language and turns a phrase and that kind of thing but as regards some of the sources I was uh, talking about there earlier on today some of them are available online so I'll give you some links that you can pass on to people later that'd on that'd be like, great that'd uh, be great thanks William and your ma another very interesting woman as well I took one car ride with Grace one time and it was one of the most interesting car journeys I've ever taken in my life still to date um, so Jesus I might have to get her on for a chat at some point as well Sen, and you'd be telling her I'd be stalking her now for the next while you can take my whole family onto YouTube. <laughs> 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 that's it. 
that sounds like maximum crack now. I'll tell you what. Um, hopefully, if I'm if I've you know smoothened it out in the editing process, people aren't going to be too aware of the technical problems that we've had when trying to discuss the other crowd and other supernatural forces this evening. There have been some issues. I fear taking your entire family onto the internet uh, could end up with smoke coming out of my laptop, sending me poor <laughs> laptop doesn't know what hit it this evening. And we, we made the offering to butter as well. So uh, I'm going to have to put that in the list for the next time I talk to you, I think. But it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. You're an absolute star. I've really enjoyed it. I feel like this has been a long time coming. But I also have about two or three more ideas for stuff I need to talk to you about for videos in the future now as well. <laughs> It was lovely. Looking forward to the next time. Thanks a million, Senan. I'm going to go now before it crafts out in me one final time. So hit subscribe for more fun and witchy adventures. I upload every Thursday and most Mondays or Tuesday. I'll stick a wee short out as well. Slow Nagaspanat. Goodbye and good luck to you.